Are you guys excited? Oh, they haven't had their coffee yet. One more time. So, um, welcome back. My name is Anthony Barrows. I'm a managing director at the Applied Behavioral Science Firm Ideas 42. Um, if none of that meant anything to you, come find me afterwards and I'll explain. Um, but the real reason that I'm here is because I used to work here at the ICA as a co-facilitator of the Teen Arts Council. Um, and yes, yes. Um, and was very privileged to be part of the committee that was helping to plan um, this event. Thank you, Anthony. Gosh, she's so, well. can you give it a hand to him? He's so like well put together. I'm not quite there yet. I had to put on my tie. I saw, uh, you guys know I hate roller coasters, and so I'm being very brave wearing this roller coaster tie that a teen made. And it has, I don't know if you could see it from far, but it has all of these images of kids going like, right? And some of them are like having fun, and then of course me would be like, ah, right? Because I hate roller coasters. So anyway, I'm being very brave. So thank you guys for being here and supporting my braveness of being here. My name is Carla Diaz. Let me introduce myself. My name is Carla Diaz and I'm an artist. And I am so excited to be here and to be on the board of the Teen Council here because uh, my husband and I, who were co-founders of Slanguage Studio, an arts organization in Los Angeles that does a lot of programming for teens and young adults, um, we were the first ones to pilot the teen arts program and we had about like 10 students. So some of you who are here that are back, please give it up for them. You guys are awesome. Yeah, so I'm so, so excited to, to be part of this. So um, we're gonna cut right to the chase. We've got two amazing speakers um, to kick off the morning. Um, and I'll tell you about the second one first. So we've got Ron Dorsey joining us. Um, and he is, yes, he, he, he's building his own brave space here in Boston as the inaugural chief of education, a cabinet level position for the city of Boston. And he came to that work after a career in both philanthropy as well as program evaluation. And he'll be telling you about um, his work today um, after we hear from our first speaker. Patricia Frazier. Oh, don't you love that name, Frazier? So I'm going to read a little bit here and kind of come back because I just got to talk to her and just got to know her a little bit, but I still need this as reference. I'm going to read it. Um, Patricia is a filmmaker, an activist, and a student at Columbia, uh, Columbia University in uh, Chicago. She was born and raised in Chicago's Bronzeville neighborhood. In 2018, she was named the National Youth Poet Laurel, Laurette of the United States. Uh, Frazier's writing has appeared in several publications, including Breaking the Chains, Southside Weekly, and most recently she profiled by Vogue magazine. This fall, she released her first poetry chapbook, Graphite, and uh, is a proud Davis Putter, Putter, excuse me, Putter Scholar. She is a member of Assad's Daughters, an inter intergenerational women's collective focused on Black Lives Matter. Oh my God, isn't that amazing, you guys? Give it up for Patricia Frazier. How y'all doing? Good, that's so good to hear. I'm so, so excited to be here. I was just telling them over there, I'm so happy I get to talk to young people. So many events, I'm talking to older people and my work is for y'all. So like, please tell me y'all here for it. <laughs> um, I'm gonna start off before I get into some poems and my sappy stuff with an essay that I wrote, and I'm super, super proud of it, but it's just about young people, specifically um, young black people who are misnomered, young black people who are in neighborhoods tarnished by Chicago media. I'm up here, I'm from Chicago, nobody loves Chicago more than Chicagoans, so literally everything I'm gonna read is about Chicago. <laughs> All right, um, I'm just gonna hop right into it. Like most experiences from my childhood, I don't remember where I was when I heard the song. I don't quite remember the name of the song, but I know the lyrics and why they stuck with me. I see you dreaming, your dream's gonna save us all. Tasha's song is an ode to black girls, lamenting all they do for their communities at such young ages, how they already deserve rest, how even their dreams are revolutionary. I turned 20 years old in October. 
I spent all of my first 19 years on my first book, Graphite, an ode to my childhood and all of her daytime pretty, sleeping through mama's college courses, my grandfather's old Chevy conversion van blasting Motown through the city, a jukebox of black history. Like most emerging artists, I wanted my first book of poems to celebrate my origins because I know my childhood deserved a world of beauty. But some poems just can't be romantic. The one about the park across the street where my memory is punctured by a bullet. Some poems are cloaked in mystery because the stories are too dangerous to tell. But for black people who are products of public housing projects, I had to tell the story honest. For black youth who are constituents of neighborhoods tarnished by Chicago media and ashamed of where we come from, because shame is the first part of forgetting. So let's talk about those lines in Tasha's song. How a dream could save a whole people. Young people, incubators of creativity, but in under-resourced communities, are rarely giving playing fields to create. What to do with our blocks is still being discussed by people who get paid to talk from the comfort of other neighborhoods. We know what's missing. We're just waiting for someone to listen to us. Instead, all of our history and all of our news comes from outdated texts and news reports, so in turn, we are forced to reimagine where that inspiration can come from. But what happens when there are few to no black movies about black kids coming of age without also being about black pain and trauma? Where's our Greece? Our Sandy called Sandra with her waist length box braids swinging between the white wires while her crew sing middle school mantras. Danny called Daniel shooting dice in the hallway and everyone collects their coin and there is no shootout after. I wanted this essay to be an excuse for me to reimagine what childhood was like for the project black girl. Trading giggles with my sister over the cute girl I have a crush on. My cousins and I riding our bikes into the sunset and away from our middle school peril. About how I'm called onto the porch and daddy is there waiting to show me my city. I can't tell these stories because this is nonfiction prose and all of the anecdotes are mere fantasy. Maybe because the street lights never gave us enough time outside, I have to write this story without sugar for craving tea. But maybe if people know what my neighbors look like, they'll think twice before boarding up their homes. Maybe if they know the candy lady's story, they'll build a grocery store where she's the manager and they only hire folks from the zip code. Poetry helps me with the building blocks, with what could make black life better and inevitably make black youth better. Poetry is an engine like a smoking compass, helps me envision all the places I could go, all the things my community could be. That's why literacy is so radical, why black kids shouldn't stay in a child's place but instead scream on an adult stage. Again, we know what we need. We're just asking for fuel. Instead, blackness wrestles with youth. Blackness is too busy for youngness. Since becoming the National Youth Poet Laureate, I find myself struggling with what it means to be a young person. People ask me what it means being the Youth Poet Laureate, and I tell them what they want to hear. It's amazing. It's, over it's overwhelming. I couldn't be more honored. The bags under my eyes chuckle. Mama taught me the significance of hard work early, my first job at 13 years old. I started organizing with Asada's daughters at 17, learning to vote, learning to fight with my people before I could even vote with them. This year, we've been organizing against a $95 million cop academy that our mayor, Rahm Emanuel, wants to build on the west side in the same area where six out of 50 Chicago public schools were closed down due to lack of funding. People can't believe it is a campaign led by young people. People ask, what white person is telling them to do that? Like black kids need white saviors to tell us we should fight for our education. Whenever I'm interviewed about my position as poet laureate, it always ends like this. All this, and at only 19, what were you doing at 19? The question is almost always posed at a room full of Chicago and suburban white folk who at 19 were skateboarding or underage drinking with homies that would live forever as designated drivers. I wonder if they can tell that sometimes I'd rather have had that I turned 20 years old in October. I wave goodbye to my childhood self in the rearview mirror and pray for her. I pray my adult self knows we deserve childhoods where our only worries are homework, prom, and our parents' divorce. We deserve stated to discuss what we think could make our situations better. So what if my dialect ain't pretty and neat? Take my stories and the neighborhoods that come with them. Make sure you remember no matter how they're dressed, we live here so they are credible. Don't let our stories fall victim to single lens white guilt that only exists to exploit and make dramatically visceral the woes of urban black youth. If we're being honest here, 
My childhood looks like sitting in the back seat while mama plays chauffeur, driving around kids, boyfriend, and the sagging bags under her eyes all day. Patricia Smith opens her book, Incendiary Art, with the poem, That Child, Emmett, in That Casket. It tells the story of how black people tell the story of death, how they hung that picture of Emmett everywhere in their homes, but rarely was there a picture of you. You sparked no moral. You were alive. Our parents, busy making sure we are financially secure, sometimes have little room for the emotional labor of parenthood. Our mothers, too busy worrying about what could become of us to pay attention to what is already in us. So many of us spend our childhoods indoors, mamas at work, losing childhood to grandmother's news programs, which think they know more about our front porches than we do. In my chat book, I write a poem about all the reasons black kids should just stay home. I want this essay to inspire all the reasons we should stay out past our bedtimes. I want this essay to be an invitation to all the kids to run out of sight of your doors and shout whatever you need to the great sky. I hear your story, and they are so powerful, I know the rhythm. Your stories are so powerful, they can be like incantations, strong enough to bring back our childhoods lost to anti-blackness, potent enough to give my mama her adolescence back, sleeping sound on the twin mattress, dreaming of what black childhood could be, filled with unrelenting mouth, undisturbed snoring, and living, pulsing possibility. Thank you. So, thank you. So, away from all seriousness, I like to use my poems to have fun, or a little fun with the seriousness. And I talked a lot about my mom in that essay, so I'm gonna read a poem about my mom. Um, I think a lot in talking to young people and in being a young person, I'm trying to think about how I break the barrier and how we break the barriers, or this like presumed barrier between when our art matters, right? My friend and I were booked to perform at a show um, with one of our favorite singers, Tasha, which is the person I was talking about in the essay, and last minute they said, oh, the venue's 21 plus, we can't make room for you to come. It's just like, she told me like, I don't want a beer. I want people to listen to my art. I want my art to be valid beyond me being 19 years old, beyond me being 20 years old, right? Um, and that's just stuck with me a lot. And so I'm just working on ways to deconstruct those preconceived notions of young people not being valid or not being able to handle adult situations when like a lot of my life and a lot of our lives as artists, as young artists, as freelancers is about trying to handle yourself in adult situations and trying to seem necessary and valid. And so I start here with my mama, which is where I started, um, who was the first person who kind of broke that barrier to me by having me. Um, and this is called Auditioning for the Role of Child with Teen Parent. Look, I know a vice special when I see one. It looks like me and my mama curled up on the twin mattress in the back of grandma's apartment. 16 in prayer, we were the queens of the wick wasteland. MTV thinks equality means casting girls that don't look like me and my mama. I think we could use the check. We know what we're here for. Working twice as hard for a closed caption, we lighter fluid to a childhood. After school special, a secret slipped in Brett Kavanaugh's cabinet. Still, I slay every role. The twice more likely, lucky accident, Gilmore girl, lady with a body that makes a mouth, put it on everything she pregnant. When I get arrogant, I remind myself that I am only what can hide inside of an oversized polo hoodie. I am seen, but not here. Rich nigga, poor nigga, still a harrowing tale. Y'all late. I thought my mama was badass before Kylie Jenner did it. I never believed the hype of nine to five girls who had their head in the books because every chapter was my mama's name. I understand I'm auditioning for a character, not writing the script, but I know this could be so much more. I think my mama is more beautiful than an anti-abortion billboard. I think my conception is more radical than a stupid mistake. What if she's a teenage mom and this is still a story about black excellence? She doesn't need the master's degree. She doesn't need a world-class viola tour. Give my mama a push cart for losing the baby fat before prom. Give my mama a Pulitzer for the way she wrote my absence letter when I just needed a day off. Hear me out. I know time is money. I know I'll get the part. I just wanna piss something first. This could be a story about a black girl from the projects who has sex at 16 and gets pregnant. Or 
It could just be a special about me and my mama eating flaming Hots on the couch at 12 a.m. We understand what it could have been, but we're here now, and we like it just fine. Thank you. All right. Um, and so that's a little soft, but a lot of my activism, and, and a lot of my activism work, I like to talk about that, right? I like to talk about sexual health and like sexual knowledge amongst young people and amongst teens because we do it, right? Like it's no secret, but everyone wants to pretend it's a secret and in turn we get hurt because of it. Um, so a lot of my poems are just like, hey, I'm gonna talk about this thing real quick and it's kind of awkward, but y'all gotta listen to it. And so that's this poem right here. It's kind of like a haiku, a little small rupee core poem. It's called, Ode to the Condom Stuck Up There. <laughs> For you did the messy labor of making us unafraid to see our bodies open and endless for ex endless and open for exploration. Thank you. That's that poem. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, last thing about young people, but I think poetry is super, super teenage, like super, super teenager. If poetry was a person, she'd probably be a 16-year-old girl crying and watching Charmed in the bedroom. Um, and so I use poetry to get out a lot of my teen angst, especially about like my partner and like just times when I feel like crying. And so I think that's super important because a lot of times we think that poetry and art, especially in general, is only supposed to be used for our traumas and for our sadness. Um, and I think that's bullshit. Um, and so I'm gonna read a poem that's just about me being sad about my boyfriend and that's what poetry is going to accept from me. <laughs> All right. It's called Absence. Wake to an empty bed, drool drying into the pillow, curly pieces of me dancing on cotton. In the closet, all of my different selves, gone. Books of poems about love left on the nightstand. All the Lucille in the house nowhere to be found. Wake to the glorious morning of my face f fading into disposable film. The medicine cabinet, empty. Refrigerator emptied, the weight on my shoulders emptied. All around you, I've been disappearing one skin cell at a, at a time. I'll leave you looking for me with flared nostrils. You'll start to smell the blood missing from the mattress. I'll leave you sniffing until you are searching for me in the fabric of an old winter scarf. But I am already somewhere much warmer. Thank you. All right, I got a couple more poems for y'all. And so I'm also like very queer um, and very here for queerness and all that gay stuff. Um, <laughs> and I think my queer self right now in this very moment is where I'm pulling my most inspiration from. I'm very proud of this poem. I don't know if y'all understand this poem, but this is my very first like good sonnet. Um, and so I'm clapping for this poem. It's called Hiding Place. And just to give you guys a little context, it's about my first relationship with a person who wasn't a man and with a person who wasn't a woman, just with a person who was gender nonconforming and like in a time where I'm investigating my gender and trying to investigate what that means to me, especially thinking about how I'm a poet of geography and I'm a poet of location. I just told y'all I'm reading a bunch of poems about Chicago. Um, but also I'm a poet who's investigating space and the spaces we create with each other even if they're just like very, very small. And so this is kind of like an ode to my futon. It's called Hiding Place. Someday I'll walk out on loneliness, unafraid to die holding your hand. But for now, this living room is all we can trust. These stains, the futon won't bother unsettling. My love comes down without tragedy today. There are no daunting eyes, no sharp whispers to quell the alchemy of our lips meeting in the sun, which spies behind the curtains to tell the gospel of our shapeless bodies, our radical silence, our unspecific coming out. Shame has no room in the matrix of our alcove, our cranny of prolific cotton. What is almost acceptable outside is already commonplace here in this old new future world, this futon where we need not wait. And that's that poem. All right, I got two more poems for you guys. Um, and so in my book, I talk a lot about um, as my essay, I talk a lot about gentrification and like the places we leave and what happens when we leave those places and where do we go and how are we affected. 
And so funny story, I, well, this part of the story isn't funny, but I, would gr- I grew up in a neighborhood called Bronzeville, which is like very affluent black neighborhood, well known throughout Chicago. The part I grew up in wasn't so well known. Um, I grew up in a project, the Ida B. Wells apartment complex. Um, and that was the only part of the neighborhood that was literally like in a gate, boxed off from the rest of the community, um, and violent, like terrifying, very, I was very afraid to go outside, but not because of what was there, but because of what the TV told me about what was right outside my door. Um, And I didn't take advantage of that. And then a couple months ago, I got a notification on Facebook um, that from, to join a group called We Are Group 39. And it turned out to be like a bunch of people from the projects that used to be and are no longer there um, community and just like being in community with each other and starting a group. And I thought that was kind of funny. I don't really participate in the group because it's a lot of people who are like, oh, I remember you when you were a baby. Do you remember me? And I'm just like, uh, no, not really. Sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah, I did write a poem about it. And it's called What to Do When the Wells is Turned into a Facebook Group. <laughs> <laughs> Go to church and pray. Thank the Lord for finally getting rid of the police cameras. Log into your childhood home and be grateful for thick walls. Now you can argue in the privacy of a direct message. Now you can post on the block and not have to watch your back. Now shorty who said it was popping next time she see you gotta send a friend request. (laughs) Ain't this the life? A play date in the comfort of your bedroom. No more waiting on the front porch of purgatory. Daddy always shows up when you type in his name. A vigil is just comments under a digitized obituary. We are still dying, but in better places. Shit. If I knew this was the price I had to pay for permanence, I would have stopped going outside a long time ago. Because who needs liberation when your prison is comfortable? All right, that's that poem. And I have one more poem for you guys, and I'm going to get out of your way. Um, And so I'm off on my own now. I just recently moved into my own apartment, and I love it, it's great, but I had a lot of like premonitions about moving there, a lot of people who just told me that it wouldn't be good for me, Um, and so I wrote a poem about it, (laughs) which is what I do when people tell me not to do things, I just write about them. Um, I'm sorry, let me find it really quick. Um, Yeah, and it's called A Poem for 71st in Wabash which is the new neighborhood I moved into. All right. The block, a loose square, packed like sardines. Loose screw people keep up the pace. People know a street light's bedtime like a backhand road. People know parole don't keep the cartel sleep. Mom say we're sick for picking a block with such a backstory. The building shot up last year before demolition. The uneven foundation of my body could be swept away by a storm of smoke powder as I'm left gasping for fair housing rights. At least I know my neighbor's name, her perm waving a stiff hello from the front porch or the window of her bedroom where she watches the building swell fat with broke young people, pockets too thin to notice the paint peeling, the blood waiting to escape my veins, to rest his set once he hits the street air, the boy out on the corner who could trigger initiation, the woman with the nice garden who makes sure he won't. Since I moved here, I walk twice as fast because of what my family tells me about this patch of Chicago land, a city caught in the wrong throat. I walk like I don't know how quickly saliva decomposes, like I don't know how quickly a mouth can swallow a whole people before even checking for nutritional value, before even knowing the block's name all the words that make Park Manor a home. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. If after this you wanna come up and buy a copy of Graphite, I have a bunch of signed copies. Um, Only $10, they help me eat. (laughs) See me after the show. Thank you guys so much. Good morning, everyone. That was really enthusiastic. Let's try it again. Good morning, everyone. All right, all right. So it's already bad enough that I have to follow Patricia. This is a setup. This is really a setup here. 
But uh, one, I want to give Patricia some Midwest love, as I often remind the mayor. I proudly serve Boston, but I am a Detroiter, so <laughs> Midwest represent. Um, I also want to thank the ICA, Jill, Monica, Gabby, Anthony. This is one of my favorite places uh, in the city and some place that always feels like home uh, when I'm in the city. So for those of you either who don't spend a lot of time here or are from out of town, welcome to the ICA. There are a few better places to be in the city of Boston. And so uh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I see some slides getting arranged here, and so I'm going to filibuster a little bit until, uh, until this happens. But, um, Monica, I would ask that you, you time me. I, Monica gave me 30 minutes, and when she said, you've got 30 minutes, I said, that's more than enough time. And then I started preparing, and I realized how much I had to say, and it's far too little time. <laughs> So uh, I may hurry through some things. We'll figure out what's complete and incomplete, but we'll have some other time to talk. And it's a little longer because there are some things that I want to ask you along the way. Uh, so we'll just jump right in here. Uh, so when I thought about uh, what I would say today, and in particular thinking about the future of learning, I was trying to figure out what the opening image was going to be. And so I was thinking about, you know, maybe there'll be robots and technology exploding all over the place. Maybe I pull some scene from a Janelle Monet video. Um, but this image is not provocative in the same way that maybe some of those images are. However, this is a very important focal point uh, for all of us, I think, because despite the new trends and, and where we see education headed, I want to begin by conveying two points to you, that however we imagine the future of education, it's still about people. And so I wanted to make sure that we saw that first. The second thing is, however we think about the future of education and learning, it has to have a radical equity agenda. We cannot be in the habit of perpetu perpetuating the injustice uh, whereby which we imagine a future that does not include people of color, uh, that does not include people from other places around the world, does not include LBGTQIA, uh, does not include people of different abilities. So we need to make sure that we keep each other honest about that equity agenda as we imagine the future. And I'll admit to you right now that we may not touch on it as consistently as even I would like, but let's make sure that we keep it in front of us. Uh, so there are actually a lot of things that I like uh, about this picture because a lot of the right stuff is happening in this picture. It's STEM focused and we're all in education talking about STEM these days. Presumably it's not just students learning about science, it's students actually doing and learning to be scientists and it's focused on students of color and young ladies as well. But as good as this is, if we perfect what you see in this picture, to my thinking the best that we will do is deliver the best 1970s education that we can muster for kids. Uh, and we know that that is not good enough. So despite a deep need to do some remediation in education systems, because a lot of what we talk about are the things that have been historically wrong, the things that continue to be wrong and create disparity, uh, I would argue to you part of the reason that we're stuck is that education systems don't anticipate the future very well. Education systems don't see what's ahead and sometimes realize that working on that incremental thing that might make us feel better today actually does not solve the long term. There needs to be a leapfrog solution that uses a set of different tools and has some different objectives in mind. And so what I like to say is that oftentimes we are traveling on a road where we can see exponential change at every mile marker, but we're in an Etzel. We're in a DeLorean, which at one time, when I was a kid, and I won't tell you how old I am, but this was a thing, if you saw Back to the Future, it's that car. We thought that was futuristic. That is no longer futuristic. And so we've got to figure out what is the thing that is going to carry us into the future. And so I want to start this conversation at a different place uh, in young people's lives and, and begin a little bit of an exploration with you. So can somebody tell me real quickly, what do you think this is a picture of? An interview. All right, we got it. So this is a job interview. I've been spending a lot of time with uh, companies around the country lately, and particularly a lot of innovation companies, design firms, tech firms, and a lot of other 
uh, folks that you can imagine in that space. And so, uh, you know, part of what we've been exploring with one another is what are they looking for in future talent and how do they identify that talent? We'll talk about the what they're looking for a little bit more as we go through this presentation, but I wanna talk now about how they are coming to identify talent. Uh, and unsolicited, and I didn't prompt people around this question, but oftentimes when people told me how they're identifying talent, there was a question that came up repeatedly that absolutely shocked me in some ways. What do you think that question was? Just shout it out. Don't be shy. Shout something out. You are creative people. Come on now. What do you think the question was? What's your age? Another question. What do you think the question was? Where are you from? I heard another one. Where do you live? Other questions. What do you think they were asking? What school did you go to? Give me one more. What do you do? All right, those are all good. Those are the questions that we expect to be asked in an interview. This is the question that employers told me they're asking more often. <laughs> Why do you think they're asking this question? Capitalism. Capitalism, all right, all right, okay, okay. We're going, we're going to unpack that one. I heard, I heard another answer out there. Why do you think they're asking this question? <laughs> we have artists and comedians in here. This is good. This is good. This is going to be a lot of fun. I got a long way to go, so this is going to be good. So how many of you have side hustles? All right. We got a lot. Of, what'd you say? It's all the side hustle. So we got some side hustlers up in here. Uh, so what's interesting about this, and I heard part of the answer from uh, the left side of the room, right side of the room for you, is that they're asking this question to get a little bit of a deeper picture about your capability. And so somebody over here said, it's about your personal and professional passion. It's about whether you're entrepreneurial or not. It's about whether you can create a vision and make it real. It's about the connections and networks that you have, how you move through the world. It's technical skills, and interestingly enough, they all kind of told me technical skills are actually fairly low on the list for us because we need to figure out if you can participate productively in the community, we'll teach you the technical stuff, which I actually think that part of the statement is a bit of an existential challenge for school. Uh, if many companies are starting to say, wait a minute, we think we can do some of the things that heretofore we've thought about school doing better. Uh, it's about proficiency with technology increasingly and the ability to add value. So can you come here, take a thing that we already think is good and make it a whole lot better? If these are the skills that folks are looking for, and presumably this is what's going to be important for a career and life beyond the workplace. The question is, how and where do we teach in-demand, future-ready capability? Unfortunately, it may not be in school as it's currently conceptualized. And so a few things to point out for you here. Um, and let, let me back up and say something real quickly about the side hustle question. Part of the reason that is being asked is because your academic record actually doesn't say that much about you. Um, also, there are a lot of other people whose records look just like yours, and they're trying to figure out what's most unique about you. Your resume may provide a little bit more insight, and it may say more about your accomplishments and where you like to work, but it doesn't say that much more about who you are and how you like to work. And so this is one of the questions that they're trying to get at. But here, here's the challenge with school as we currently conceive it. So the, the difference between this, school, between this school photograph, which is probably taken 125 years ago, and school today for the most part, is that the picture today is in color but there's a lot 
of the stuff that happens in the building today that happened in the building 125 years ago. Now, there are some things that are immutable about what good education is, and we need to continue to do those things as well. But there are some things that are challenging for modern times. And so when you think about instruction still continuing to value knowing over doing, the question is how do we actually get to capability? And I think it's a both end, and capability is what you do with what you know. But if you don't have the practice spaces to do these things and it's all knowing, we don't know if we get to capability. And I'm not trying to denigrate or put knowing on the, the lesser side of this, but it's very much a both end. School often uh, prioritizes simulation over immersion, as well as uh, fragmenting time in, in a variety of different ways. And so I think what this does is prevents us from getting to authentic learning. And what I mean by authentic learning is that it requires dynamic interaction in real world experience. And so authentic learning is learning from people whose lives are directly impacted by society's modern challenges. It's about learning in the rich context in which life takes place. And so authentic learning is not mere abstraction, it's not distant observation, and it's not repetition. It's participating, it's experimenting, and it's definitely failing. It's discerning from prior knowledge and putting that together with the experience that you have to make meaning uh, over time, and it's deepest when it's immersive, when we can explore our beliefs, our assumptions, and our imaginations in real time and in the real world. Uh, school also fragments time, and so this stifles the way that we think about interdisciplinary skill building as well. So math happens separately from history, happens separately from art, happens separately from ELA and language instruction. But this disintegration of skill building means that we don't build the kinds of complex skills that we know it takes to be successful in the world today. Part of this is because school also has a very antiquated understanding of work. And so school as we know it, and we oftentimes talk about it, was designed for more of an agrarian economy. It's still about uh, a certain time of day, uh, the school year being uh, segregated from the harvest season, for the most part, and the planting season. Uh, and it still, at its best, kind of anticipates the needs of manufacturing, which are segmented, kind of siloed sets uh, of skills that, again, are not the way that we work. And so this is not really a reflection of the, the 21st century approach to either learning uh, or work. And so we have to question whether school, as we think about it, uh, is becoming an anachronism of sorts. Uh, what is not here that I want to mention is that schools and school systems in particular were not designed to take into account that we have to make sure that we support diversity. They were not places that were planning for pluralism. And so part of what we have to think about going forward is that we've got to undermine what has uh, for many years been more of an assimilationist agenda uh, that has been about norming behavior and norming identity in some ways uh, instead of asking who's here and how do we build you up because that is what's most valuable. So we've got to begin to reimagine uh, what school is, and school is only a part of learning, so let's agree on that because most learning still takes place outside of the school building, even though most of our turf wars uh, about learning are about schools. Uh, but if we're going to reimagine uh, learning, we've got to first better understand who future learners are, we've got to better anticipate changes in skill demand, and then we have to take that information and begin to rethink. Rethink the purpose of school and learning, our ideas about space and time, educator identity, and the learning tools that go along uh, with our pursuits. And then we also have to think about how do we make education and learning systems more adaptable. Oh, sorry about that. So this graphic I took from a, a trend firm called Sparks and Honey. It's, it's a firm that I, I love to follow the stuff that they're doing because they're always kind of taking this metadata and, and prognosticating about stuff, so it's good. It's a fun uh, exercise. Uh, what I love about this is that it starts to give us a little bit of a profile about who uh, young generations in America are. We talk a lot about uh, millennials, and there are probably several millennials. I love millennials, so despite all the, the rhetoric 
Um, you guys are killing it. Um, but when we think about Gen Z, and I think Gen Z is also in the room as well, these are largely young people born uh, after 1994. They are very different in a lot of ways than millennials. And so when we think about Gen Z, they're tech innate. They work on many screens uh, at a time. And so where millennials were tech savvy, Zs have it in their DNA to be connected to technology. Uh, Gen Z is proactively and provocatively challenging identity constructs. They're highly communal and networked and eager to work and have entrepreneurship embedded in them. And they have a future orientation and want to contribute to making the world better in a lot of ways. And so, you know, what this brings up for me is that uh, both Gen Z and millennials are still being taught in many of the same ways that we taught the greatest generation, boomers, Xers, and a number of other people. But when this tells you that these are fundamentally different people in some ways, we've got to figure out how to meet the learner in a different place uh, and to work with them with the tools that they most value. Uh, let me read you a, a quick story uh, by a young writer named Elena Giolando, who is a Gen Z writer. And she uh, wrote a piece for, I think it was Forbes, called I'm Living Proof That It's Time to Redefine the American Dream. And so she says, I've been a minimalist nomad for years, freelancing in international project management for a variety of organizations. As a result, I've lived in Ethiopia, Nigeria, and Qatar. And when I'm not working for companies like IBM or Uber, I'm traveling through Asia or South America, making ends meet with my blog and coaching business. She concludes this glimpse into her life, noting that hers might not be the typical path, but we should really figure out whether that's true or whether that's becoming true, that it's the typical path. But it's the type of 21st century career, she says, I built for myself because the old model is no longer as accessible or as appealing as it used to be. This is not only a bit of an appeal for access to opportunity, but a call for different kinds of opportunities better suited to modern tastes and modern life. And so what she's really saying to us is that as we imagine it, we have got to prepare every young people, if every young person, if they're anything like her, to be global, to be multicultural, to be transdisciplinary and startlingly fluid in some ways in how they apply a set of vocations. Uh, they have to be code switchers, and that's not only traditional language, but that's kind of code switching between a number of digital languages uh, as well. Uh, they have to have reflexive entrepreneurial skill. It can't just be the things that they're learning and testing out. It has to be habit, and they have to be network driven and network embedded in some ways. And so we have to continue to ask, are these the things that traditional education are preparing us for? As we rethink uh, or re-examine who the learner is, we also have to better anticipate what skills change looks like as well. What is the world asking us to be able to do? And uh, I'm mindful of the, the capitalism uh, comment as well, and so I wanna name that this is a frame that is really about uh, what the career space is asking for, but I would also argue that uh, there are many of the things beyond the technical skills that are here that are also about the future of life skills as well, but we should continue to talk about that. So uh, here is what the Sparks and Honey folks think uh, is the reality for careers going forward. Careers are now complex, fragmented, specialized, collaborative, and ever evolving. More often than not, our work life will be made up of a portfolio of micro careers. Some of what this is telling us is that the future is as skills dependent as it is knowledge dependent. It's a future where entrepreneurial prowess and the ability to create value may trump degrees. And I, I don't often like to say Trump, I meant it as the verb uh, and not the person. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a Voldemort thing. I try not to say that. Um, it's a future that is even more dependent on social capital and young people's ability to cultivate and manage broad social networks. So part of the reason that employers are asking questions about the side hustle is, first of all, the social contract is different. They don't expect you to be with them for 30 years. 
So they want to know, fundamentally, what's your purpose? What are you driving toward? If, if part of your stop is going to be in this company, we want to understand what you're helping to build along the way, not only for us, but for you, because you aren't going to be here forever. And that's something that they typically accept these days. This is a uh, graph that was recently put out uh, by the XQ High School Redesign National Initiative from the Emerson Collective. Uh, and this gives us a look at big changes in skills by 2030. Is there anything on here that surprises you? Shout it out if it does. Empathy, Empathy. Uh, yeah, all right, anything else? Critical thinking is low, all right. Anything else? All right, let, let, me, uh, let me highlight a few things that jumped out to me about this. Part of what this doesn't show, and in another part of their brief, it does show, uh, is that the, the data presented here show that the biggest skills declines in the forecast are around things that have to do with physical labor and basic thinking. So this goes back to this mono skill thing, the one thing that you can do, the compartmentalized thing that you can do. What we're looking for are a lot of integrative skills. Of course, there are some skills up top that are really about where technology is going. But again, I want to remind you, when I talk to companies, they kept pointing to the middle skills. They kept saying, this is what we want to figure out with you before you even walk in the door. Because if we don't have a great sense of this, we're not sure you're the person for us. And in fact, as important as that stuff at the top is, again, they keep telling me, if we're confident about the middle, we're going to teach you what's at the top. You'll acquire that by being here. Uh, I also want to point to creativity here, because sometimes people think that's at, at odds with what's at the top uh, in particular. And increasingly, it's not. It's a fundamental driver for what we're doing. Now, where school is concerned, and certainly there's uh, a lot of angst and anxiety about the disappearance of the arts uh, in schools, but I want us to consider that the ICA may always do it better than school does when it comes to arts education. So there's a big question about where and how to learn and with whom that we'll continue to explore. But a couple of more insights uh, about this. Um, you know, all of the skills on this list, school touches some of them, but it's certainly when we think about uh, school level accountability and uh, standards testing and a number of other things, few of these things are explicitly called out as the purpose for which we are having young people show up to school every day. So we need to start to rethink how we get here and it's better reflected in accountability. Uh, I think we covered the, the other insights uh, that I wanted to share again about the middle and employers increasingly, increasingly teaching the top. But what this starts to translate into is something that looks a little bit uh, like this. This is uh, actually a graph from the Council on Foreign Relations who uh, issued a report uh, about where skills and labor in the U.S. are going uh, in the next couple of decades. Uh, and what the, the graphic here shows you is the kinds of jobs that are growing uh, in the economy right now. The bigger the bubble, the larger the space uh, for growth and the more hires that are being made across the economy in some likely and unlikely places uh, as well. These are not all tech firms. Uh, and a bunch of other places. Some of these things we know. Uh, we've been doing these things for a while, and so uh, our web designers and computer scientists, even our biostatisticians, et cetera. But there are a couple of things in here that may catch us off guard. Who knows what a UX designer is? Tell me what a UX, UX designer is, Anthony. User experience. User experience designer. So most rooms I go into, they're not as smart as you guys are. They're not as worldly as you guys are and don't know what a UX designer is. But in some ways, this is about the mashup between human-centered design, anthropology, and in industrial engineering to really think about how it is people interface with the technology and products that we're uh, producing in the world today. The thing that you should understand about all of these jobs 
is that they're hybrid jobs. They integrate a set of skills in a wide variety of ways, and it's not just positioning you to turn the wrench and pass it on to the next person who has a different skill. It really is, it, it takes being a polyglot of sorts to do this, uh, the kind of work described here. So when we talk about the future of automation uh, in the US, this, this piece at the top, uh, workers in less complex roles are seven times more likely to spend a significant portion of time on automatable activities. And so these are the people, when we think about who is most vulnerable in the economy, it is people doing single skill jobs or kind of basic skill jobs. We've got to get everybody to an integrated uh, skills level. Uh, automation is only a threat if we don't continue to evolve uh, in some ways, but we can already see whom it's a threat for and we've got to take some measures to protect them and not just say, too bad for them. Here's the kicker. So we're still trying to catch up to the present from an education and learning standpoint. But 60% of the best jobs in the next decade have not been invented yet. And so we're seeing new roles emerge almost daily. The question for education is, how do you anticipate skills development when you don't even know what the future skills will be? That's a hard thing to do in an institution that hasn't been very good about anticipating the future uh, to begin with. But part of what we should train our, continue to train our eyes on is that skill development, wherever it's happening, in school, at the ICA, around the city, future-proof schools are, skills are going to be those things that are uniquely human, the things that we think only people uh, can do. They're complex and they're adaptive. They will evolve with our needs and with the needs of the world over time. Uh, maybe they won't uh, evolve at the rate that uh, artificial intelligence is evolving, but they will evolve in some ways that only we can show up for one another. And so part of our task is to continue to call out uh, for one another and figure out how to train for these uniquely human, complex, and adaptive skills. And so now we need to start to do some rethinking, rethinking the purpose of school and learning, time and space, and a number of other things. How much time do I have? All right, I may actually do this. Um, so this is Boston's first take on reimagining the purpose of school and learning. Uh, this is what we call the college career and life success framework. Uh, what you don't see here is algebra. What you don't see here uh, are some of the classroom subjects that you may be used to. Uh, what we did was a multi-sector design process that included educators, young people, business, uh, higher ed, and a bunch of other folks to start to ask the question, what is it that every young person needs to be able to do and know when they graduate from a high school in the city of Boston. And this is our synthesis, also taken from some similar efforts uh, around the country uh, where researchers are trying to synthesize this uh, as well. The first thing to point out to you is that this is a paradigm shift. So we're trying to move from content acquisition and retention to thinking more about skills development. Uh, we're trying to move from strictly building academic and technical competence to actually building young people's agency. We're also trying to shift from schooling, which is the structuring and sequencing of lessons in ways we know already don't work for us for the most part, to a broader enterprise around learning that is more about youth development. It's inclusive of school, but it takes more systematic advantage of using all of the resources in a community to promote learning and young people's growth. Um, so there is small writing here, which describes the competencies under five big domains. But basically what we want to train for, uh, and training is maybe not the, the right word, but prepare every young person for, is to be able to set a vision for themselves, to be able to choose a course for themselves and pursue it, to be able to change course and be resilient, because I think most of you know that as well as you plan a thing, sometimes things don't go as you expected them to. But that can't be derailing for young people. And so if we have a set of skills that we are helping them to nurture that are about resilience, they'll change course and stay on a path for success. 
Of course, we want to build competence, and this is the box in which many of our traditional academic uh, preparatory pieces live. Uh, and we also want young people to learn to work with others. Uh, increasingly, we see for a variety of reasons the world depends on uh, collaboration, mutuality, and the kind of empathy that is going to take to develop a productive future. And so if you will just kind of stay with me for a minute and say, hey, Ron, I kind of accept. This looks like the future of education. This is maybe a more relevant uh, purpose for what education and learning looks like. Then we have to start to think about reimagining space and time. So the competencies that form this definition, if you got a chance to look at them very quickly, one of the things that you will notice is that you cannot acquire those skills simply by going to school. You have to be in the world to, to acquire many of those skills. You have to be with other people to acquire those skills. You have to be in intergenerational, uh, diverse environments to acquire those skills. And so part of the work that we're trying to do in Boston is to make sure that the city becomes a classroom for students. And that means the, the ICA is a leader on this, and I'm not sure anybody is doing it quite as well right now. And so we're going to lean on the ICA to continue to provide the example. But we've got to open the doors to our CBOs, our cultural institutions, our college campuses, and our businesses with the expectations that these will be learning environments, and they are programmed uh, as such for young people. Uh, the, the future here is about uh, figuring out how do we challenge the notion of seat time in schools. That's part of what's holding us back. Uh, by statute, there is a requirement that there is a certain amount of time that students spend in the seats in the classroom. If that's not the most productive use of time, we've got to challenge uh, some of those restrictions or imagine that seat time also takes place at Vertex. Seat time also takes place at Bunker Hill College. It takes place in a number of places. We're smart enough to figure out how to aggregate the hours that young people are spending if they aren't just spent uh, at the McCormick School or the Burke High School. So we've got to figure uh, that out. Um, our goal is anytime, anywhere learning. And so school can probably be a hub for that, but buildings don't stay open all hours of the day. Uh, if we are accepting that we've got to get outside of school to learn, then we've got to figure out how do we toggle between the building and what happens outside uh, of the building. But we want to make sure that more time is spent beyond the building. As we think about how we get to uh, the competencies and the capabilities in the framework that I showed you, I think we have to accept that there will be many teachers and many modes of teaching. So what I don't want to uh, in any way convey is that classroom teachers are disappearing from the future. They're not. They're probably more critical than ever uh, in a number of ways. So uh, we need to continue to have them as anchors in what we're doing. But it is also the case that as the world continues to change, um, disciplinary knowledge and content expertise won't necessarily be resident with the classroom teacher. Uh, that expert in bioinformatics, the classroom teacher may very well understand that. That expert, though, understands a lot about the application and the malleability of those skills and of those techniques. What they may not be good at is teaching anybody to do a thing. Um, and as, as a former social scientist myself, I will tell you that there is almost some genetic inhibition we have uh, uh, around teaching anybody anything. So we need to uh, rely on, on teachers uh, for their expertise as well. But we've got to be able to connect to those experts so that young people hear it straight from the horse's mouth, so that young people have a living example and a connective example of what it looks like to apply these skills in the world. The future is also about a lot of self-led learning. Students will be DIYing it a lot and creating their own paths, in part enabled by ed tech, but also uh, if we're serious about the city as a classroom concept, then we've got to create a new freedom and agency for young people to say, this is what I'm passionate about, this is what I most want to explore, and here's the path that I'm going to create for myself to do that. 
yeah, we need chaperones and we need people who will provide support uh, along the way, but increasingly students will lead their own learning. All of these folks who take on the teacher role and support roles will increasingly be relying on ed tech to some degree. And there's a lot of controversy about where ed tech is going. I'll say a little bit more later, but we're not gonna spend uh, a whole lot of time on it, but know that there will be many modes uh, as we think about how technology is applied to learning. But let's consider that as important as teachers are to this enterprise, we may need to ask them to work with us to redefine their roles. So we need them to be the instructors that they've always been. But I would also say that uh, in a world where, again, content knowledge may live more outside of the school space than inside of the school space, we're gonna need teachers to continue to be active learners and continue to be more active learners uh, in some regard, to keep pace with even basic shifts in content development and skill training. We're gonna need teachers to be better learning partners. Teaching will become more learning with than imparting to in a lot of ways. And so it's already the case, and I, I found this out startlingly with a, with a group of students last winter, that many students have more background knowledge in subject areas than we give them credit for, and oftentimes more background knowledge than adults have. And so oftentimes we, we are teaching to a set of assumptions about what we think young people know and get surprised by what they actually know and then embarrassed when they know more than we do. And so we've got to figure out how we're going to be learning partners with them. Teachers will continue to be designers. They're already designers. Lesson planning is design. Uh, classroom setup is design and a number of other things. But increasingly, they may have to be something that is more akin to UX designers, really thinking about who the student is and how the student interfaces with the tools of learning uh, over time. Teachers will have to be curators. And so in the era of fake news, you know why this is important. Uh, not all information is good and reliable information. And we need to rely on very smart people who are discerning uh, what reliable information looks like and organizing it expertly to promote understanding, retention, and utility. And then we will need teachers to be Sherpas. You will need to be guiding young people through the world and to the sources that are important to their learning, even when this is self-led learning for uh, a lot of students. There are still many places that you will know out of habit and out of discovery that you need to lead young people to for the purposes of learning. Uh, the portfolio of tools is changing and expanding uh, across classrooms, beyond classrooms and whatever. Uh, Ed tech is a whole other speech. And so uh, we, we probably don't have time to get into it, but know that there are new learning applications and devices coming online every day. We're toggling inside and outside of the classroom and between real and virtual worlds. And so that's a trip to a lot of us. And the more schools that I visit, especially the digital world is getting way out ahead of school and we need to figure out how to anticipate it. One of the most fascinating things that's happening in ed tech though right now is that it's becoming important to student assessment in some ways that I know I didn't fully understand uh, until I started learning more about it. So what we're starting to learn is that for instance, and these are dangerous things potentially as well, uh, ed tech is using facial recognition technology to measure gaze time, attention and interest in a task. So while you're looking at the task on the screen, the task is looking back at you and asking how involved and engaged are you in what you're doing. Uh, we're connecting student input across tasks in lightning fashion to gauge retention and adeptness at application. And so we're kind of flicking through one task, next one, but it's testing the same skills and kind of in a metacognitive way, machine learning is saying, was Anthony good at repeating this skill across a set of activities that maybe he didn't think were the same activity. And then wearables are being used to measure learner stress and reaction, looking at the relationships between cognitive function and biological response. Uh, I'm learning that ed tech's uh, imagination is almost limitless. And so the challenge for us is to discern what's quality? What's a quality device and application? How do we maintain focus on tech as enhancement and not 
uh, instructional replacement? And how do we determine when too much tech is too much, uh, especially if it's undermining pro-social skill development? And so I don't think we'll stop the wave, but we've got to ask the critical questions about the wave. So now I'm about to land the plane for you. Here we go. So under 20 years old, do you know this company? Good, good. All right. Um, so this, this is interesting. Sometimes, uh, especially at a certain generational level, this is a company that is not familiar uh, to very many people because we don't see this company very much. Uh, prior to the 1990s and early 80s, this was one of the cornerstones uh, of the American economy. Kodak, makers of film, uh, makers of cameras. But in the early 80s and 1990s, this company disappeared at least at its scale then and almost uh, completely from the landscape. Why did it disappear? Yes. This is what happened to Kodak. So, you know, there are, there's a more complicated story about Kodak than, uh, than I have time to tell. But the oversimplified version is you took freestanding technology, which was Kodak's camera, and kind of the inputs, which are film, you integrated it with another technology that was being disrupted, the phone, because the phone that hung on our walls or sat on the, the entryway table in our homes started disappearing because of this as well. You made it interoperable for many purposes. So it's not just taking pictures, but it's scanning barcodes and doing a bunch of other things. And you all but made that freestanding technology that Kodak was married to obsolete. And so part of Kodak's story is that it fought this wave of disruption to its own detriment and died rather than adapted. Uh, an acquaintance of mine, a guy named Mark, Marcus Shingles, who is the president at XPRIZE, recounted this story to me several years ago to point out something important about education, both K-12 and higher ed alike. He said that education is in trouble for the same reasons Kodak was. It does not know how to adapt and it does not know how to innovate. He said the biggest challenge for us is that education has to figure out how to iPhone itself before it gets Kodak. It needs to figure out how to iPhone itself before it gets Kodak. I hope that some of what I shared with you about how we need to rethink education puts us in a better position to iPhone ourselves, but there are a lot of questions to be explored about that. And honestly, there are questions to be explored about whether I'm right about anything I said to you today. But we've got to put it out uh, in the ether and debate it uh, with one another. That last statement is a provocative statement, but I'm looking forward to discussing it with you more. So thank you for your time today. Okay, so um, I'm Monica Garza. I'm the Charlotte Wagner Director of Education here at the ICA. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> you guys are finally here. <laughs> um, we have an action-packed day with lots of different sessions, and I know some of you did not get your coffee and might be wanting more coffee. So um, I wrote a set of questions, but I also want to open this up. Uh, because we just have a few minutes to see if anybody, first of all, has any questions for either Patricia or Ron, or Patricia, if you have questions for Ron, or Ron, if you have <laughs> questions for Patricia as well. I just want to open it up first. Nobody? All right. My question for Patricia Great. is how can I be that dope? No, that's my question. <laughs> <laughs> my question would be intergenerational learning. 
<laughs> okay, well, um, I'll start off with just a couple of questions and then we'll move on to our next sessions. But I was wondering um, from both Patricia and Ron, um, if you can talk about your own, because you know everyone that's here is really working with out of school time programming, mm -hmm. really, and a lot of youth as well. And um, I was wondering if you can talk about your personal experiences with out of school time learning. I'm very prepared for this after your talk because like, <laughs> I think you were very scientifically investigating all the things that I'm thinking about on a daily basis. I'm writing about actually. Um, so I'm thinking a lot about education in terms of like, one, I'm in the process of transferring and trying to figure out what I want from academia and what I'm willing to give to academia, but also thinking about the ways in which I can capitalize on the popular education I've been afforded, right? So like. Everything that I know, everything that I've learned, everything that I am is because of what organizations have afforded me. I learned to be a student through being a student of organizations, a student through Young Chicago Authors, a student of Asada's Daughters. Um, in high school, I was a horrible student, just absolutely horrible. And teachers loved me because I was always willing to participate, and I was always willing to talk, and like, but I was never willing to do the work. I never felt challenged. I never felt like my peers were interested. I never felt like my educators were interested. And I really did not feel like the things that I were t was learning were for me or yep. for anything that I wanted to do in the future. And so now I'm at this point where I'm doing a bunch of freelance work. Like, everything's the side hustle, right? And so trying to think about how, as a student in CPS, Chicago Public Schools, there was no space for who I am now or who I'm trying to become. Um, and so I'm thinking a lot about educators, especially like the educators I've been afforded, specifically Asada, at Asada's Daughters, um, our, the co-founder is Paige May, who is literally the person who taught me that, hey, you are also my teacher because you are an expert of your own experience. You are also my teacher because this is a circle and I'm just facilitating the way that the education is experienced. I'm not here to bank any, I'm not here to feed you any information. I'm not here to tell you like how to process what I'm giving you. I'm allowing you free reign to do that all your own and I'm helping moderate that. And I think that was super important to me because I just started, um, I just became a teaching artist um, with the organization that I came up through. Um, and that's super important to me, one, because I'm learning a lot about, again, what type of education I want, but also what type of education I think all of my peers would deserve, especially as people who are looking more toward having careers in art, um, which isn't focused on in schools. And that was something I had like a really big beef with until you said that ICA is gonna do a much better job than my high school women and girls would have done. And I really, really relate to that. Um, and yeah, I just thank you for all of that because like my mind is like, ah, <laughs> in so many different places right now. I'm so excited. I'm so happy that we're- um, I wanna pick yeah. up on something you just said about young people being, uh, being teachers. Uh, one of the most important uh, school experiences I had uh, was in college with a professor named James Schaefers. Uh, first day of class, uh, he went around asking us very provocative questions. One, he was teaching outside of his subject matter area. He was an architect teaching in the economics curriculum. And so it was already a brave thing uh, to be doing. But he asked one student uh, a question. The student kind of played it off and you know, made some snarky remark. And he said, I'm gonna come back to you. He asked the rest of us questions, came back to the student. Same thing happened. Chafer shut the class down. And he said, look, first and foremost, I'm a learner. I rely on you too much to teach. If this is the attitude you're gonna have, I'm gonna need you to leave. The young man left. He, he didn't understand what Chafers was asking him. He didn't understand what he was asking from him. And the whole semester was really this guy in learning mode. Uh, it was the most incredible uh, educational experience that I've had. But I will say um, to your question, I was great at school. I was great at school because uh, I knew it was a thing that I had to do well and get out of the way to actually learn the things I really wanted to learn. So I got that stuff out of the way. Uh, me and my guys were rhyming and making beats. Uh, I was drawing comic books uh, with, with my crew and we were selling them in stores in Detroit and doing a whole bunch of other stuff. I was active in sports. So the things that I loved, I knew that I, I wasn't gonna be able to participate if I wasn't really good at school because it was gonna be a different negotiation at home. Um, so uh, I got good at it and learned that there are ways to be good uh, at school, which is kind of unfortunate uh, in some ways. But 
you know, there were a number of formal programs that are, were important to me, an uh, organization called My Heritage House in Detroit. Uh, I spent so much time at the Institute of Arts in Detroit, uh, it, I, I can't even log the hours. Uh, it's one of my favorite places and was uh, as a young person. The last thing I'll say is I was apprenticed into my profession. So I went to work for uh, a public policy research firm when I was 15. Um, I didn't know what else to be but uh, a policy researcher because I had a professional who was a friend of the family who said to me, I'm not just hiring you for the summer, I'm teaching you to run the business. And so it will be your choice at some time in your life whether you want to succeed me or not. Uh, it is not an obligation, but I do expect you to take the skills and do what you think uh, is best for you. And so while all the classroom stuff was important, it was amazing at 15 to be in this environment and by 19 running the state and local projects for this company. I hope you're still making comic books. Uh, <laughs> I'd love to see I, that. I, I, I do when, I'm in, when I'm in meetings and people are saying stuff yeah. that I'm not interested in. <laughs> you're blowing my mind just hearing this. <laughs> um, you know, Ron, uh, I found a uh, presentation that you gave several years ago at Boston University uh, for a graduation ceremony mm -hmm. for a school of education. And in the presentation, um, you were encouraging the graduates, presumably a lot of classroom educators were in, in the audience, to be those activists, innovators, and organizers. Well, those are the words that you were thinking about. Then I think about, you know, you know, was, I've been reading Patricia's book and reading her biography and thinking a lot about the people that are in this room. And I just wonder also if these ideas of being an activist, an innovator, and an organizer, and this goes to Patricia, um, if this applies to more than just those teachers, but also those students that are caught up in an educational system today, you know, just to get ahead of. Yeah, definitely. I think organizing, for one, is one of the most creative things you can do because you're always having to think around and think, what can I do since there's this barrier here? What other route can I take? And I think traditionally we're taught to just walk in through the front door. Um, organizing teaches you, there's more than one way to enter a house. You can enter it through a window, you can enter it through a chimney. So definitely like thinking about how we think and like in which ways we think, um, but also thinking about activists and empathy and being on the ground and talking to the people and like learning my, like so for, for instance, before SADA's like opened up its doors to male identifying folks, it was mostly women in film, films. Um, I was very stuck in this like, oh, I, Black Lives Matter because I'm in a school that doesn't have this and I'm in a, in a neighborhood that doesn't have a grocery store for a mile and I'm in this, this, this. And then I meet all these boys who are in gangs, who, are, who don't have phones, who don't have credit cards, who don't have all the things that I've been afforded and I realized how fucking privileged I am, especially now. And I think just communing with them and being with them past like knowing this boy on my block that I sometimes occasionally say hi to, but actually having conversations with them, I learned how, just how important those stories are and how important like, how important it is that they're on this panel instead of a person who can talk pretty and like mm -hmm. can speak very well and like mm -hmm. has been through all these different forms and modes of academia, right? Um, and so I think having more people doing that work of like actually being on the ground and actually talking to real life people and learning from like real life people who are like experiencing it and who are in it um, definitely builds the empathy for creativity but also to like go off and adapt to other situations and other modes. So like because of that, because of Asadas, I'm able to go into any room in any space and just read the energy of the people, right? And just read how the like, the demographic of the people tells me so much about how I should talk, about how I should present that code switching thing, right? And I think activism is a great setup for that because I'm either in a room with those boys or I'm at City Hall listening to a bunch of aldermen vote mm -hmm. yes on a bill that's gonna potentially, that's gonna like be violent for so many young people, right? And in both situations, I have the same goal, but I have to present very, very differently. And so I think activism and organizing in that way has been more of a teacher to me than anything, just like understanding and knowing and listening to people. Um, and so, yeah, that like state of being a perpetual student and always going through that cycle of everybody here is a teacher, everybody here is a learner. Yeah. Let me pick up on something that Patricia said, because I think she got to the heart of the matter uh, that I was trying to explain uh, in that 
commencement speech, um, when you talked about uh, there being many routes to a different uh, set of solutions, um, one of the things that I was trying to make plain for people is something that a uh, labor organizer in Texas, Andy Stern, uh, makes crystal clear and like it blew my mind the first time I heard him say this. He said there's a difference between mobilizing and organizing. Uh, and what he said about it was mobilizing is the building of the critical mass of voices to express the collective grievance. Mm -hmm. So we've got to get people to come together and to say, hey, this shit isn't working. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we're not going to stand for it. But the deeper point he was making is that sometimes mobilizing masquerades is organizing, and organizing is, in fact, the creation of the systems that are the alternatives to the unjust systems uh, that we are mobilizing uh, against. And so there's a creative part of the work where I think we've got, gotten very good at mobilizing, and certainly in, uh, in the context of the political moment, uh, mobilizing is happening, but we've got to start to think about the creative space in which we start to imagine the systems beyond the ones that don't work for us. And certainly the credit union system to some degree uh, is an example of this. When marginalized people were uh, kind of forced out of the traditional economy and not given access to capital in a number of ways, folks kind of said, we'll figure out how to organize capital access for ourselves. And that was really the germination of the, the credit union movement. Uh, coming out of the, the Great Depression. So we have to continue to think uh, in those ways, but it requires a different kind of agency and a different kind of uh, perspective on ourselves than we oftentimes have, because I think, you know, mobilization is, is the tool we most turn to out of necessity, but I also think it's the one we turn to because we don't imagine more expansive civic roles for ourselves. blowing my mind, sorry. <laughs> I need to take it all in. <laughs> um, you know, as we begin all of our day-long sessions, do you have any, what are the questions that we should be asking ourselves? Do you have any advice or thoughts before we enter these discussions? I'm always thinking about questions in general. Like, what are the actual questions that I want to ask? Am I asking a question because I feel obligated to? Am I asking a question because I just really want to talk to this person and they really interest in me? Mm -hmm. Or am I actually asking something that's for me and for them, right? Like, am I challenging something? Am I trying to build a conversation around something? Um, necessarily, specifically, what I mean is, OK. A lot of the times I get asked the same questions. What inspires you? Why do you mm -hmm. write your poetry? Um, what gives you hope? Mm -hmm. um, these really sometimes racialized, sometimes like medium specific questions that don't, that aren't, that isn't really providing anything extra to the audience. And I'm not asked about what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Why did you write a poem about your mom being a teenage parent? Are you advocating for this, 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 and this? Like, it's not about the art, but it's about what we build after, right? What the com what, what conversation the art brings. And so I just really advise you all to think very critically about your questions, but also to ask them, because this is such an opportunity, like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this person here is just like incredible and completely accessible to you and right here, ask the question, bro, like that simple. and. It could change your life, just the question. So like, think about the questions you're asking and ask them, please. Yeah. All right, I want to go hide behind the curtain after that. I'm going to be blushing the whole day. Um, I mean, I think, uh, you know, one of the questions we should always ask ourselves is do we own our own development? Um, and if, if it's not a question that you can kind of be in touch with at, at every moment, uh, and asking how am I going to get from here to there, with whom am I going to get uh, from here to there, um, and what am I going to contribute in the process, because I also don't want to set it up to be a frame where it's about me getting mine, but it, it's oftentimes about uh, if, if that development is purposeful, it's also about contribution uh, as well, but if we don't have sight of it, I guarantee you nobody else will own your development the way that you will and should. Uh, and so you've got to be the first agent for you and the first agent in your, your own learning. Um, you know, I, um, there were a few years ago, uh, I have a 12-year-old niece um, who lives in the Congo. And um, she was uh, in Boston at a school. 
I was with some educators. They were asking me about you know, her grades and test scores, and I, was, I don't know what test scores she has. Uh, but but they, were, they were like, well, why is that not important to you? And, and I said, well, look, here's the thing. Um, whatever experience she has, I need her to be an agent. So she's got to develop self-awareness. She's got to, um, she's got to have a sense of her own destiny. She's got to be in touch with her own humility without having that subvert her personhood. And, and I said, the reason that I need that from her, whether it's going to happen in school or not, uh, and I need her to figure out what her passion is. When she figures those things out, she will learn at a rate that the rest of us can't keep up with. I don't care what the grade is. I don't care what the test score is. But if she figures out who she is and what she most wants to learn, I guarantee you we'll be trying to catch up with her. Very nice. Yeah. Well, if there aren't any more questions. Oh, there's one question up there. <laughs> or maybe it's not the most, um, I, I don't know, it's not the most uh, holistic way to learn art, but um, I'm curious about what sort of systems or what sort of organizations would work for rural communities. It's super easy for us to access each other and organizations that are doing something different, Detroit, Chicago, even Milwaukee, but what about people who are growing up in places who don't have access to those things? Interesting question, um, and I will admit not one that I've thought a whole lot about, but, um, you know, one thing, you know, having spent a little bit of time in rural communities, uh, especially in the Northwest, so I, I spent quite a bit of time in South Dakota and in Oregon uh, and, and also uh, in First Nations communities. Um, so one, I mean, so I would actually separate First Nations communities from some other places because the way that art gets embedded into how life is lived uh, in Native communities is a lot different than we typically think about it in, you know, uh, American spaces uh, for the most part. So there's a lot to be learned there. Uh, but I think part of what I did uh, learn uh, through my time in rural communities is that you know, people who are involved in rural economies are makers. So there's a lot that they're doing that we might not call art, but the process of the making is happening in a variety of different places. And so one of the things I would think about is how do you start to uh, leverage that organic knowledge and capability in some ways that either brings students out to it or brings it into uh, classrooms. One of the things that you have a, a deeper advantage around in rural communities is social capital. And so uh, part of the reason I was spending time uh, in rural communities was to better understand their conception of community versus the way that we conceive it in cities and more metropolitan spaces. Um, their, their sense of my tiedness to you and, and my identity being a reflection of who you are is much deeper than we see in much more transient places, which urban areas uh, tend to be. So I would not minimize that, even if it's informal and not systematic, we've got to build on the social capital that uh, exists in rural areas. Now, we may have to take on the time and space dilemma, because if you really want to activate those social capital ties, you have to make time for the relating. And so you can't just confine people to the school building if you want them also to spend time with Mr. Johnson because Mr. Johnson makes incredible things in his barn or wherever he makes them. So um, I think it's a design uh, question for sure, but the building blocks are there to do something uniquely powerful. Well, thank you both for joining us this morning.